Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, the potential future Queen Consort. Everyone that met her said, God, she's wonderful, she's so funny, she's so magical. On the surface, a conventional royal partner, always destined to be by Charles' side. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. But her story is much more Hollywood than Highburn. She wrote a very rude message in lipstick on the windscreen and let the tires down. Who is the woman that Charles risked everything for? That the Prince of Wales has admitted publicly for the first time that he was unfaithful. It is reported she met Charles boasting that her great-grandmother had an affair with King Edward VII. Why did her relationship with the future king mysteriously falter? People have said, slightly tongue-in-cheek, senior members of the royal family were there at the wedding just to make sure it really happened. How did she go from being seen as Britain's most hated woman? This must have been an absolutely traumatic period in her life. She loved Roy. She had, up until that point, really been relatively anonymous. Before Melbourne, was she the original unsuitable bride? Mountbatten was absolutely horrified. He insisted that Camilla was excellent mistress material, but was certainly not wife material. This is the story of Camilla before Charles. It's been a roller coaster of a relationship with lots of turbulence, complications, a tale of love, betrayal, and redemption. It's almost Shakespearean in its tragedy. You couldn't make this up. May 1989, the Aegean Sea just off the Turkish coast. A prince and his former girlfriend are sunbathing on a boat. They think they're not being watched, but the paparazzi were there, and the implications will send shockwaves through the House of Windsor. There were photographs of Charles and Camilla in a launch in a speedboat together. Charles was shirtless, topless in, in his swimming trunks. Uh, uh, and it was quite striking. And, and those really were the first time uh, that the wider public and the media began to wonder whether there was something going on. Many were now asking if Charles and Camilla had rekindled their relationship. It was a rather a reckless thing to do when Charles was still a married man. Um, and it, it, it was a reckless thing to do because it pushed Camilla right there in the spotlight. In public, Charles doesn't comment on the rumours. But a 1989 transcript of a phone conversation between the two reveals intimate details of their mutual affection. Whilst rekindling her relationship with Charles, Camilla couldn't have predicted the epic fallout that would unravel over the next 10 years. I think Camilla must have been an extremely robust person to, to deal with, with, with the torrent of media interest, um, strange telephone calls, paparazzi following her around that, that, that was her life. How did this seemingly unassuming woman find herself on the wrong side of the biggest scandal of the decade? Derided, isolated, and at rock bottom. The story starts eight years earlier with a wedding that mesmerized a nation. Camilla Parker Bowles at this stage was married herself, but remained a close friend to Charles. It's thought she even encouraged him that Diana was the one. In that period, Charles's life was difficult and he knew he was under pressure to find a wife and Camilla thought she'd be perfect for Prince Charles. But before the wedding had even taken place, there were signs the prince and his future bride may not have been the perfect match it initially seemed. If you look back at that, engagement interview, you can see that they're really not at ease in each other's company at all. They're not a tactile, loving couple. I mean, Charles just simply can't bring any um, em emotion to the interview. Can you find the words to sum up how you feel today, both of you? 
difficult to find mm. that sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and, and happy. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. Yes. Uh, Whilst reportedly encouraging the marriage, that was as far as it went, according to some royal observers. Camilla might have been the older woman who had dated the prince before Diana and who was in a good position to give Diana some, some counsel in those early days. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen like that. Charles and Camilla had met 10 years earlier through a mutual friend. The first time when they met in 1971, 72, they, they had a brief um, romantic relationship. Uh, it only lasted for about six months. Camilla married Andrew Parker Bowles. The second phase of their relationship was when she was married to Andrew. Prior to the wedding to Charles, had Diana known how close Charles and Camilla had truly been? Were there warning signs? Shortly before his wedding, Charles wanted to thank a number of women who'd been very kind to him over the years of his bachelorhood, and Camilla was, was one of them. Diana found this bracelet that Charles had had specially made for Camilla. It had G, the, the initials GF on it, and she immediately realized that this was for Camilla. And Diana was said to be aware of the nickname Charles had for Camilla. When Prince Charles was growing up, a very, very popular show on the radio was The Goon Show. There were two characters in it called Gladys and Fred, who were like lovers. And these were the nicknames from very, very early on that Charles and Camilla gave each other. It really, you know, hurt her. And she became obsessed. She became obsessed with Camilla. The wedding went ahead on the 29th of July, 1981. Watched by a global television audience of 750 million people. Probably the, 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 the most flamboyant um, wedding anywhere in the world in the last century. I mean, extraordinary, an extraordinary spectacle. And in the congregation, Camilla Parker Bowles. And Diana knew that she was there. The history that Camilla had had with the man that she was about to marry, and it's, it's quite poignant, I think, that out of the thousands of people in St Paul's, it was Camilla who Diana zoned in on. How are you enjoying married life? Highly recommend. Diana naively believed that as a result of the marriage, you know, the missus would fade away and we'd all live happily ever after. But, of course, that never happened. You know, and contrary to what a lot of people have said, a lot of commentators have said, Camilla didn't go away. As time wore on, cracks began to appear in the Wales' marriage. After the birth of Harry, the marriage really had started to unravel and go down very quickly. I mean, part of the problem was, was Camilla um, in, in Diana's mind, Charles had never really given her up. She was a constant presence. By the end of the 1980s, the Wales's relationship was in serious trouble. And I think Charles was so unhappy that he started, you know, pouring his heart out more and more and more to Camilla. And then, you know, then they rekindled their romance. 1989, Ormley Lodge, Richmond. Diana and Charles attend Camilla's sister's birthday party, and suspicion is about to turn to confrontation. There was this extraordinary atmosphere that once we'd arrived, um, Diana arrived, and of course there were the, the friends of, of, of Camilla and indeed her sister. Ken Wolfe was Diana's bodyguard and was there on the night. About an hour and a half later that um, Diana voice was heard you know, along the corridor near the kitchen where I was actually sat, shouting my name. And she said, I just can't find my husband or Camilla. We began a, 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 an exploration of, of the house. Sat on a sofa was uh, the Prince of Wales and Camilla actually talking. And um, 
Diana said, listen, please don't treat me like an idiot. You know, I know what's going on. There was no attempt by Camilla to deny Diana's allegations. Diana didn't have any proof, but she had a hunch. So they, you know, and all, all hell was going on upstairs because everyone was saying, gosh, Diana and Camilla are having a confrontation downstairs. And Charles knew that this was, you know, this was the moment to leave. But of course, on the return journey home, nothing was said in the car. That really was the, the beginning of the, of the end of the Wales's relationship. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. After the separation, Charles and Camilla's relationship remained in the shadows until Princess Diana goes on the offensive. Well, then in, in, in the, the summer of 1992, which was the Annus Horribilis, um, Andrew Morton's book was published. This was the moment when, when Camilla was absolutely 100% outed as being, you know, the mistress of the Prince of Wales. The book serialised in the Sunday Times today claims it was the Prince's indifference to his wife that caused her chronic depression and five separate suicide attempts. The first time she had press camped outside her home, this must have been an absolutely traumatic period in her life. She had, up until that point, really been relatively anonymous. She's out. Here. Her name was out and she was going to have to live um, with this label of mistress, adulterer, marriage wrecker. But worse was to come. In January 1993, the People newspaper published the transcripts of the conversation between Charles and Camilla, first recorded in 1989. It was hugely embarrassing because it was almost lavatorial in its descriptions of their love for each other, what they wanted, how they longed for each other. I wonder whether Camilla knew in that moment exactly what had happened to her, and I think it would have hit her so hard that from, from now on, she's public property and public enemy number one. Today, the Duchess of Cornwall cuts a very conventional royal figure. It's hard to imagine how she ended up embroiled in a scandalous affair. But there are clues in her early years that reveal a very different character to the one we see now. Broderick Munro Wilson grew up with Camilla. She was slightly rebellious. I, I mean, she shared a room with my second wife, and of course, smoking was a was a forbidden thing. But anyway, she was definitely smoking as a teenager. Camilla's friends all loved her. She was the you know she was always the one at the centre of everything. She was terrific fun. Boys adored her because she was funny and characterful. I mean, she wasn't a beauty, but I mean, I, I think she was approachable and she was very, very popular. Thank you very much for giving us this silver heart. But I still think you should, should have given one to good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> 1960 swinging London is in full flow and 18-year-old Camilla Shand is said to dive headfirst into the party scene. She did have some jobs, like she worked at Colfax and Fowler, the, the decorators. She didn't last a week. One morning, she overslept after a very long party, and, and I think she was probably rather hungover, and she arrived late and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. And the boss at head Colfax and Fowler, who was a, a demon anyway, just absolutely tore her apart and sent her packing. And that was the end of her, her working career. She was famously a party girl in the mid 60s. And, you know, she might go to three parties a night, uh, five days a week. I mean, she was extraordinary. She absolutely loved partying. And this fun-loving, vivacious Camilla catches the eye of many of her peers. She was not without her admirers, let me tell you, because, you, you, know, you, you know, she she looked very nice. She was always beautifully turned out, and she had a personality. You know, she had things to say for herself. She was talkative. Uh, um, I mean, if you sat next to her at a dinner party, you were delighted because you knew you'd have a good conversation. But this young, carefree period of her life doesn't go unnoticed years later. 
Pamela had had a past, and you know, at, at times quite a raucous past. She was known, particularly in palace circles, for being a party girl. In fact, Camilla's family's reputation went back many, many years. And it is reported to have broken the ice when she met Charles by almost boasting that her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, had had an affair with another heir apparent, King Edward VII. So she was aware of that royal connection. It shows what an extraordinary family they were. Alice Keppel wasn't a sort of dark, embarrassing secret. You know, the fact that she'd been mistress to a king, this was something the whole family admired. It's not surprising that Camilla's great-grandmother was able to move in royal circles and for the alleged affair to have taken place. Her family have been on the fringes of the aristocracy for generations. Born Camilla Shand in 1947, she had a textbook childhood of privilege, growing up in rural Sussex. She had a very happy childhood. Um, she was the eldest of three, the firstborn, and then she had a, a younger sister, Annabelle, and then their brother, Mark. Her father, Major Bruce Shand, was a real military hero. Um, he, he was actually given the military cross twice, which is the most astonishing thing, a very, very gallant officer. Her mother was from a very, very wealthy family called the Cubit family. Um, and the, the Cubits in the 19th century had built much of, much of central London. She lived about 15 miles from me. And, and the great thing is that we were all in the pony club. Everybody had a pony, everybody rode, everybody hunted. We used to have little mini dances which would start at about 8 o'clock and go on to 12, where you'd have, you'd dance for two hours, have a sort of buffet dinner, and then dance for another two hours, and then somebody would come and the chauffeur or somebody would pick you up at 12 o'clock. That was, that was Sussex society. As the daughter from a traditional upper-class family, Camilla followed the well-trodden path set out for her. Coming from the family that she did, an aristocratic family, um, her, her father, Major Bruce Shan, very much respected military man. I, I, yes, in many ways, Camilla's life was mapped out. It was never going to be overcomplicated. Camilla attended Queensgate School in London, um, a very prestigious school. She was known as Miller. She was known for being pretty posh, but also good fun, and at heart, a tomboy who was definitely happier on a horse um, than in the classroom. She went off to a finishing school nine months in Switzerland on the shores of Lake Geneva, where she learned to ski and perfected her French, but uh, not much else. There was no emphasis at all on, on doing well academically. I think Camilla got one O-level um, because she was taught to get out of a car while keeping her knees together. I mean, they really walked around with piles of books on their heads so they would walk beautifully because they were tra being trained to be wives. And at this time, the question of who would be good to marry within this world of wealth, money and privilege was obvious. A member of the royal family would be the ultimate catch. I think society was, was more hierarchical, really, right up until, until the 1970s and the 1980s, and it, it's hard to realise how, how powerful the class system um, was in Britain in that era, especially at those echelons of society. I think it was always expected that she was going to marry someone that would either give her a title or at least a double-barrelled name, and that she was going to marry up into those aristocratic circles. But was this the life for Camilla? Did she want to marry a duke or an earl? I don't think she uh, especially did. She had a number of early boyfriends who weren't aristocrats. She had no particular ambitions to marry up. The 25th of March, 1965. It's Miller Shan's debutante party. The party turns out to be a landmark moment in her life. She had a coming out party at Circe's which is just behind Harrods, which was one of the fashionable places to do it. The rite of passage, again, for these, this kind of upper-class um, English family would have been that their daughters would go through the debutante season. 
and that meant that they would go to loads and loads of parties and have loads of drinks and lots of food and meet lots and lots of men, maybe a potential husband. And that was the whole idea. At Camilla's party, she's introduced to a striking young man. She was then 17 when she first clapped eyes on, on Andrew Parker Bowles, who was a rather dashing army officer, about uh, seven or eight years older than her. I think Andrew Parker Bowles was what's known as a Deb's delight. So a Deb is a debutante, an attractive upper-class girl interested in meeting somebody interesting and well-established. And Andrew was your kind of perfect person to have at such a party. Um, very, very lively, although he had a bit of a colourful reputation, Andrew. But he was a very, very attractive and, and handsome man, a, a real catch. Romance blossomed between the two had Camilla found her perfect match. Camilla was the one that got him. I think she thought that she knew his reputation, she knew what he was like. But I think she thought that, that, that she could tame him. But sadly, of course, she couldn't. By 1970, there are rumors Andrew Parker Bowles had begun to date Princess Anne, as his relationship with Camilla Shand faltered. Andrew didn't necessarily finish with one girlfriend and then move on to the next. Um, he, he had dated um, Prin Princess Anne, uh, of all people, and I think it overlapped with, with Camilla to some extent. A year later, Camilla was introduced to Prince Charles by a mutual friend, Lucia Santa Cruz. Lucia knew exactly what the situation was with Andrew Parker Bowles and Camilla, and she she didn't think her friend was being treated properly. So she decided that it would be a good idea to introduce Camilla to Charles. Andrew Parker Bowles was often away on army tours. Um, they took him all over the world to Northern Ireland, of course, at that time, too. And in 1972, Charles was on terra firma. He had by then been spending time in the Navy, but he was doing a long posting in the UK that with Andrew away, it sort of cleared the way for the two of them to spend a lot of time together. I think what attracted Charles to Camilla was the fact that she was not overawed by him at all. The fact that she was going out with the Prince of Wales, you know, he could have been Joe Bloggs. She didn't care. He loved the fact that Camilla was fun and could be a bit frivolous and carefree. She was very different to the other debutants on the scene at the time, and, and certainly some of the women that Charles had been linked with. And she was something of a breath of fresh air. During 1972, the relationship is said to have blossomed. Camilla went down to Broadlands on several occasions during those six months and had lovely weekends with Charles there. They were both very horsey. They both, um, you know, they, they, they had a lot in common, Charles and Camilla. But some commentators say their relationship came under scrutiny by senior members of the royal family, including his mentor and one of the closest people to him, his great uncle, Lord Mountbatten. Charles had discussed uh, the possibility of turning this intense relationship with Camilla into marriage, and Mountbatten was absolutely horrified. He insisted that um, Camilla was excellent mistress material, but was certainly not uh, was not uh, wife material, that it was impossible. Why would Camilla Shand, an educated woman from a privileged family who moved in the right circles, be deemed unsuitable for the future king? Mountbatten, his view was that whoever he married, if they weren't um, royalty themselves, then they should be of very noble birth. And all, however well-born Camilla was, she wasn't a member of the aristocracy. But the bigger problem was that everyone from Mountbatten up to the Queen was terrified <laughs> that she had a past. She had too many pasts. It looks odd, um, 40 years on, to think that he, that he had to... He could only marry somebody without a past, which, again, seems rather anachronistic now, but it, but it was thought that he had to marry a young woman who, who as it were, was um, completely pure, almost virginal. It was really the palace who made sure that this sort of fledgling six-month blossoming romance never really 
got off the ground. Charles was very deliberately sent off to the West Indies with the Royal Navy, where he was posted for eight months. In the months that he's been with Minerva in the Caribbean, he several times visited the Bahamas Islands, but this was the first time he'd made an official visit. Could there have been another explanation as to why the relationship didn't work out? It's a goal. At this time, Charles was said to be an unsure figure himself. Did he simply not take his chance and propose? Charles never told Camilla how he felt. I'm sure she was aware of how he felt when they were together for those six months, but he never expressed it. Um, or, or he, he certainly never discussed marriage with her. Whatever the truth, the fact was Charles was now over 4,000 miles away, and three months later, he receives a letter that will turn his world upside down. He was on a long tour of um, the Caribbean islands when he received a letter from Camilla um, that she was and had accepted um, Andrew Parker Bowles's proposal of marriage and that they were going to marry that summer. He was absolutely devastated, heartbroken. He realised quite literally that he had missed the boat with Camilla and he wrote to say how regretful and how sorry he was at the demise of what he called a peaceful and happy relationship, which I think indicates quite clearly that he did have something special with Camilla. He, he had something with her that he didn't have with anyone else. With their romance seemingly over, Camilla fell back into the arms of Andrew Parker Bowles and the start of a journey into years of a complicated and unfaithful marriage. I don't think Camilla quite realised the, the, the depth of, of Prince Charles's feelings for her. I think she thought, you know, he's too young for me, he, he can't marry me, I need to get on with my life. And anyhow, I'm in love with Andrew Parker Bowles and that's the man I want and that was the man she got. And the difference between the two couldn't be more striking. You've known Prince Charles for a very long time, haven't you? What sort of person is he? Well, you know as well as I do, everyone knows. He's a, he's a marvellous, marvellous leader and a marvellous man. I've heard the quote that um, Camilla said that uh, however much she uh, admired and, and felt love for Charles, is it possible to love two men? Um, I think the answer for her would have been yes, Camilla, it is, because Charles and Andrew were so different. Andrew found it difficult, certainly at that stage, to live without her. She was similar to him, similar interests, very exciting, a brilliant conversationalist. And she loved him with a sort of, you know, an intense passion. I always feel rather rotten saying this, but Charles wasn't very sexy. Andrew was a very, very promising guards officer. Some people thought he was a bit of a name dropper, a bit of a snob, but he always struck me as absolutely charming. I think that what Camilla wanted, a lifelong commitment from somebody and a career officer who in some ways was in the image of, of her father, seemed perfect at the time. Whilst Andrew might have been more alluring than Charles, Camilla had to contend with his party boy reputation. He had a string of girls who were all, you know, very happy to be in his, his stable, if you like. She knew his reputation, she knew what he was like, but I think she thought that she could tame him. I was certainly witness to the fact that Andrew Parker Bowles was a popular boy, and, and no doubt about it, virtually everybody at some stage or other was joined at the hip with Andrew Parker Bowles. There was one occasion before they were married when she was walking home one night and she saw Andrew's car parked outside uh, one of her friend's flats and knew exactly why it was there. And so she wrote a very rude message in lipstick on the, on the windscreen and let the tires down. So she wasn't a complete doormat. Despite any concerns, on the 15th of March, 1973, it was announced in the Times, Camilla and Andrew were engaged to be married. I think he was forced into the proposal because he was very aware that Camilla was seeing Prince Charles. And I think he genuinely feared 
um, that if he didn't pull his finger out and make an honest woman of Camilla, he might actually lose her. He wanted Camilla to be the mother of his children. He could see a, a future with her. News reaches Charles over 4,000 miles away that Camilla is engaged. According to insiders, he took drastic action and fired off several letters. He wrote to Camilla and, and pleaded with her to reconsider, but I think by this point it was just too late. She was, I think, his first real love. And, and when you fall first, sometimes you fall hardest. Andrew and Camilla's wedding took place at Guards Chapel in London. It was dubbed the society event of the year. There were members of the royal family there. Uh, the queen was there, uh, the queen mother, uh, Princess Margaret and Princess Anne. People have said, slightly tongue in cheek, that, that the senior members of the royal family were there at the wedding just to make sure it really happened. There was this enormous relief in royal circles. This Camilla problem had now um, gone away for good. It was a very glamorous occasion. Of course, the one figure who wasn't there was the Prince of Wales. He was on, on his ship and uh, he wouldn't have gone anyway because it would have been very hurtful for him to see the woman that he still loved being married to somebody else. Camilla and Andrew went on to have two children, Tom and Laura. Despite their history, Charles remained close to the young family. They managed to include Charles even in that intimate part of their lives by making him a godfather to Tom. Their lives were intertwined, particularly through polo and other social occasions. Charles was often to be found sitting cross-legged on the sitting room floor with his godson watching television or chasing the children around on his hands and knees. I mean, he, he was an essential part of their family. On the surface of it, the Parker Bowles' marriage seemed perfect, and Camilla was finally able to put into practice what she'd learned at finishing school. When you meet Camilla, she seems a very, very warm and maternal person. She enjoyed decorating the houses and, and making them homely, filling them with books, lovely fabrics, not always the most tidy house. She had a big social life in the country, and she had her two children, and she had her dogs and her family home, so almost everything she'd ever wanted. But in reality, Camilla's marriage was not all that it seemed. I think their marriage was very, very happy in the beginning. It's just that Andrew couldn't keep his trousers on. He was a serial philanderer. He was at a dinner party and a, a young woman sat next to him and said, Andrew, I'm really offended. I'm the only one of Camilla's friends that you haven't made a pass at. Oh, God, there was a huge amount of gossip. It was very well known and very well publicised that Andrew Parker Bowles um, was playing away, I think is the way we describe it, playing away. Quite how she handled it all, it's, it's hard to imagine, but handle it, she did. I mean, it was a kind of an upper-class thing. One almost expected husbands to stray not long after they've taken their marriage vows. I think for Camilla, it would have been humiliating, shaming, embarrassing, and would have left her feeling incredibly vulnerable. You're at home with two gorgeous children, and he's in London all week, and you know perfectly well what he's doing. Prince Charles started coming round to Camilla's house and they rekindled their relationship, and it seemed a natural thing to do. By the late 1970s, Camilla was said to be seeing Charles again. Andrew is a very good example of the typical upper-class Englishman. I don't think he liked the fact that Camilla was drawn back to Charles, but he was a great friend of Charles. It was one of those things that happened in life, and as long as it didn't get in the newspapers, he really wasn't bothered. But in July 1980, everything changed when Prince Charles started dating Lady Diana Spencer. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us after you. Well, it is, naturally. They started um, courting almost immediately. It was a rather prim uh, and very old-fashioned courtship. They had very few actual moments together. They scarcely knew one another. However, around six months later, it was announced they were engaged. 
11 a.m., Buckingham Palace. The beginning of a day to remember the long-awaited, much-written-about engagement had happened. He's getting on a bit, isn't it? time we got married. And this was the first chance to see the ring of sapphires and diamonds. I believe the relationship between um, Charles and Camilla continued right up to 1981. I've spoken to people who confirmed this, that um, uh, I don't know how to put this delicately, but um, Camilla and Charles had a sort of, um, uh, well, they had a last night together in the week before the royal wedding in 1981. It was a sort of, you know, a farewell tryst. It's reported Prince Charles has denied these claims. And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live. I will. Camilla stepped back, and, and, and their, their romance, uh, the physical side of their, of their attachment, ended. And um, he was faithful, at least to start with, to Lady Diana. By the mid-80s, Charles and Diana's relationship was on the rocks. Friends of Charles were convinced that he was actually close to cracking up. He couldn't make his wife happy. They fought terribly. Um, on the surface, all seemed well, of course, in, in public. They were a great double act. It wasn't long before Charles and Camilla's love affair was set to be reignited. It's always been given out that um, Charles and Camilla renewed their, their physical relationship around 1986. I think they were together in the physical sense and every other sense well before 1986. Come 1993, it all starts to unravel. The Prince of Wales has admitted publicly for the first time that he was unfaithful. Camilla Parker Bowles and her husband Andrew have decided to end their marriage of 21 years. Camilla becomes the story as the Wales' marriage crumbles. Camilla's poll ratings were abysmal. She was labelled a marriage breaker, a temptress, and worse. For somebody who was private, who'd been a homemaker, a mother, she had to show great strength of character to get through that enormous intensity of media scrutiny. Camilla became the most hated woman in Britain, if not the world. She had photographers camped outside the family home. Camilla was suddenly famous, and she was famous for all the wrong reasons. She kept stum, you know, and, uh, and was very, very dignified about it all. Diana was always finding a friendly journalist to tell her story. She never did that and I think that's great credit to her. After Charles and Diana's divorce in 1996, Camilla's official introduction into Charles's life began. Charles had been very keen to try and ease Camilla into the public arena. He was tired of, of um, sneaking around, and so he employed a, a, a PR wizard called Mark Boland to help with this process and to try and rehabilitate the prince himself because his reputation was in tatters. But a year later, everything ground to a halt. In the early hours of the 31st of August, 1997, the unimaginable happens. The Press Association uh, announced with a news flash at 4.41 that's just a few minutes ago, that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. The argument ran that had Charles not betrayed his marriage vows, um, had he not abandoned Diana, uh, then she would not have been traveling through Paris in the car of a playboy and ending up being killed. To be seen in public with Camilla would be a PR disaster for Charles. But now he needed her support more than ever before. Charles's first instinct was to pick up the phone to Camilla. And a, a desperate, desperate moment for him. There was Camilla at the end of the phone. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for her and a nightmare for him. But she has always been very reassuring. 
Publicly, it was a huge step back for Camilla. Her enduring battle with the press and public was resurrected, and she was catapulted into the center of a storm like no other. Both Camilla and Charles would have completely understood that they had to keep their relationship on the down low. At this point now, Diana has passed into legendary status. Going public with it would have been the worst possible thing to do. But she was there for him in this most difficult, darkest moment in his life. Camilla's relationship with the British public needed some serious nurturing. Decisive action was taken by the palace, and a plan was masterminded by Mark Bonnand, who was now Charles's deputy private secretary. And the way he decided the problem should be handled was to persuade the public that she wasn't some bogey woman, but that she was a very important part of the prince's life, that she made him a better prince. Discretion still rules in the run-up to Charles's 50th birthday. Very gradually, she was brought out, and it was a supreme strategy. And people started to see her in a slightly different life. And everyone that met her said, God, she's wonderful, she's so funny, she's so magical. Word sort of started and spread. In January 1999, the planning came to fruition outside the Ritz Hotel in London. Around 200 members of the press get the picture they've all been waiting for. It was just extraordinary. It was like the whole sky lit up with flashbulbs. That moment sort of sealed the deal. By and large, uh, the reaction was positive. And from then on, um, the process was able to be speeded up. Um, and, and that was really the moment when Camilla began to be accepted by a section of the British public. But would Camilla ever be accepted by the inner circles of the House of Windsor? And then the, the, the next major step was meeting the Queen. It was a party that Prince Charles was hosting. Interestingly, there wasn't a lot of briefing about it, except to say that the two women had spoken, they'd shaken hands, Camilla had curtsied, and they had chatted briefly. With their reputations on the rise, in February 2005, it was announced to the world Charles and Camilla were engaged. How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right? I'm just, about, I'm just coming down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. I'm sure there were some die-hard lovers of, of the late Princess Diana who thought, no, no, this, this is not right. But I think the British public, by and large, welcomed the, this announcement. On the 9th of April, thousands of people lined the streets of Windsor to catch a glimpse of the bride and groom. But had they really managed to win over the British public? I disapprove of this marriage today. I disapprove of the way Charles and Camilla treated Diana. It was despicable. Camilla arrived not knowing whether people were going to be standing there throwing rotten eggs at her. And she was terrified. I was there that day, thousands of people there who were just cheering for them, who were so happy for them. It was a really great day. The civil ceremony was followed by a blessing at St George's Chapel, which was broadcast to a TV audience of millions. After almost 35 years, Camilla had finally married her prince. To Charles and Camilla, our future king and queen, may God bless you both. You know, I remember covering that, that royal wedding in 2005 and, and thinking, you know, this, this is historic, this is momentous, this is, this is Charles, a divorced future king, marrying a divorcee, something that I don't think anyone really ever expected to happen. I think people thought, well, these people have, have been in love perhaps for 35 years. Do they not deserve a bit of happiness? The Queen hosted a reception for the newlyweds at Windsor Castle and gave a speech that cemented Camilla's place in the royal family. When the Queen gave that speech at their wedding party, where she said, my son is home and dry with the woman he loves, that really was the welcoming of Camilla into the royal family. And if the Queen was able to forgive and forget, 
then the rest of the British public could do that too. We could give Camilla a chance. Camilla was portrayed as one of the most hated women in Britain, but she was now the Duchess of Cornwall and wife of the future king. Camilla's life changed forever when she fell for a young Prince Charles. She's endured decades of secret scandals and struggles. Her reputation was left in tatters. The road to redemption has been a long one, but today, their popularity and love is stronger than ever. We've seen her take her role as a consort to the future king very, very seriously. Her rehabilitation is complete, and I think she has proved that she is a real asset to the royal family and for the nation.